Welcome to your favorite drive-in theater and a sparkling new season. Watch our screen for all the fine shows coming for fun-filled, pleasure-packed evenings. Relax, come as you are, and spend an enjoyable night out with the entire family. No parking problems, no babysitting problems. And there are always tasty snacks at our modern refreshment stand. Thanks, folks. And once again, welcome back. The official organization of Sullivan County took place February 7, 1780. In the same year, Colonel Evan Shelby marched from Watauga against the Chickamauga, a hostile branch of the Cherokee, defeating them near the present Chattanooga. News came across the mountains that Major Patrick Ferguson and a British force of about 1,200 men, most of them loyalists, were raiding westward. The over-mountain men of Watauga rallied at Sycamore Shoals under John Sevier and, as they traveled eastward, were reinforced by Shelby's Indian fighters and a force of Virginians led by Colonel William Campbell. On October 7th, they attacked the British entrenchments on Kings Mountain. The frontiersmen used the Indian tactics they knew so well, creeping from tree to tree, sniping at the British. Ferguson and about 600 of his men were killed, while the Americans lost only 28 men. This, the only battle in which the Tennessee settlers took a part, marked the turn of the tide in the south. While war was going on in the east, the area that is now Tennessee had been offered by North Carolina as a session to pay Congress to help pay off debts related to the Revolutionary War. Henderson's Transylvania Company had been denied title to its purchases within Virginia's territory, so Henderson and his associates made plans to exploit other lands believed to lie within North Carolina's western boundaries. The Cumberland River region was picked for the first settlement. Here Nashboro was founded in 1780. The tiny settlements of Watauga and the Cumberland were in an extremely precarious position. They were not even upon the frontiers of North Carolina, but hundreds of miles in the wilderness beyond the frontiers and open to Indian attack from the east, north, and south. The frontiersmen were always on the verge of war with the Indians. Delegates from Washington, Sullivan, and Greene counties met at Jonesboro and discussed a working plan for an independent western state to be called Franklin. In the same year, a constitution patterned after that of North Carolina was adopted for Franklin. They were repealed by North Carolina Assembly, but the Franklanders, as they called themselves, were refused to undo their work. A general assembly met at Greenville in March 1785 and chose officers to act under Governor John Sevier. For four years, there were continual clashes between Franklin officials and those sent over the mountains by North Carolina. When Sevier's term as governor expired, no new election was held, and the state of Franklin collapsed. 
like skipping stones. Oh, those are arrowheads. I found those right outside the front door. You know this whole area used to be Indian territory? You want to know something interesting? For a change, you mean? You know this place we're staying? Used to be part of an old Indian burial ground. Very sacred and holy. Oh, scary. What, is it cursed or something? Yeah. As a matter of fact, it is. Are you serious? Yeah. Don't worry about it. You're only cursed by the evil spirits if you violate the graves of the dead. We're just going to be eating hot dogs. Besides, I'm there to protect you. You? Yeah. <laughs> You're going to protect me? Yeah. <laughs> now I'm going to build a fire for the hot dogs. Why don't you see if you can find some wood? OK. Look at this. What is it? It's an old Indian dagger. God, it's in perfect shape. Bruce? <laughs> Left unprotected again, the Territorials organized the government south of the Holston and French Broad Rivers. The Constitution and laws of North Carolina were adopted. The Franklin officers were continued in power and various delegations were chosen. Franklin's government functioned until 1790, when Congress accepted the second offer of session and brought into being the territory of the United States south of the River Ohio, commonly known as the Southwest Territory. The territorial government, administered largely by presidential appointees, with William Blunt as governor, operated for nearly six years. Knoxville was selected as the seat of the government in 1792, a year after the town had been platted. Home seekers poured in from the Carolinas, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and even New England. They came with Revolutionary War land grants either earned in service or purchased from veterans or speculators. Often these grants were forgeries. Many of them came simply as squatters. The old Wilderness Road and Avery's Trace were congested with movers during the summer months. Great top-heavy Conestoga wagons drawn by oxen broad-tired farm wagons piled high with household goods, and crude sledges with runners of hickory or oak, all moving west toward the promise of land in Tennessee. Other thousands came by keelboats, pulled up to Cumberland and Tennessee from the Ohio. The newcomers were often misled and swindled by shrewd first settlers who already dominated the state, but they kept coming. By the end of the century, the wilderness had retreated before them to the Mississippi bottomlands. From the eastern mountains to the western counties, towns had sprung up, each with its public square and log courthouse, its church that served as a schoolhouse on weekdays, its gristmill, distillery, smithy, and general store. Roads webbed the hills of a forest land, connecting outlying farms and villages with the bigger towns where the courthouses and churches were of brick or stone. 
at the foot of Eaton Ridge, originally Heaton Ridge, on the east side was built a fort known as Heaton's Fort. It was built by the settlers of Reedy Creek and Cook's Valley. It was one of the first structures of the kind in the county. The Yancey Tavern, a famous house of entertainment, was built near this fort. The first mill in Sullivan County is said to have been built by John Sharp, an Indian trader. It was a small tub mill and stood on the spot occupied by the mill built by John Spurgeon at the mouth of Muddy Creek. As the majority of the first settlers of the county were Scotch-Irish, the first religious organizations were Presbyterian, and it's said that as early as 1778 two churches had been formed. These were Concord and Hopewell. The first Baptist society in the county was Kindred Creek Church, organized by Jonathan Mulkey sometime prior to 1786. The first storehouse was built by Walter James, a prominent trader who situated in the vicinity about 1785. The structure now forms part of the Easley House, which wasn't complete when an Irish peddler traded the house for a wagon of goods to a Baltimore man, James White, whose son owned the steamer Cassandra the only steamboat that ever entered Sullivan County. In that same house, E.P. Easley would conduct a barter business and would serve as the postmaster of the Butterfly Post Office in the late 1800s. On July 2, 1791, Stiff Tory William Blunt made the Treaty of the Holston with the Cherokee, who placed themselves under the protection of the United States and agreed to the extension of boundaries for white settlements. The Knoxville Gazette was established in Rogersville, and four years later a wagon road was completed through the Cumberland Plateau between Knoxville and Nashville. The Cherokee American War, 1775 through 1794, was one of the longest running native versus settler conflicts in American history. The skirmish in the fall and summer of 1794 was the last gasp of the Chickamauga Cherokee. The Chickamauga Cherokee had long resisted any kind of agreement with settlers for more Cherokee land, eventually withdrawing to Tennessee where they allied with like-minded Shawnee and Creek allies. They kept up their raids on frontier settlements, operating from a town known as Nickajack, near a cave of the same name in present-day Marion County, Tennessee. William Blunt, governor of what was then known as Southwest Territory, opened negotiations with the Chickamauga, hoping for a peaceful settlement, when members of two prominent families were killed in 1794. He decided instead on a punitive expedition against the Chickamauga. Militia units from Tennessee and Kentucky banded together and marched against the Nickajack Town and Running Water Town. Scouts had alerted the inhabitants of Nickajack Town of the militia's movements and most of its inhabitants fled, leaving a hundred or so warriors behind. As these warriors fell back to Running Water Town, they met up with the war party coming from there. They decided to engage the Americans, and a series of skirmishes led to a final encounter on the bank of the Tennessee River. The Chickamauga force was defeated, killing 70 warriors and burning both towns. Only three settlers were wounded. With this defeat, the Chickamauga had no choice but to agree to the Treaty of Teleco, signed in 1794. This would be a fatal year of defeat for many native tribes, including the end of the Northwest Indian War through the Battle of Fallen Timbers. Bluntville, the second oldest town in the state of Tennessee, was made the county seat of Sullivan in 1795. In the late 1790s, the Duke of Orleans paid a visit to the American fort known as Teleco Blockhouse while on a tour of East Tennessee. There the Duke watched more than 600 Cherokees engage in a ritual ball play at Chota. He bet six gallons of brandy on the outcome. By this time only five dwellings remained standing in the town. In 1795, William King, an Irish immigrant, moved into the Saltville Valley, purchased 150 acres, built a log house, the King Stewart House, and began to manufacture salt. The first salt mine in the United States was cut by him in 1799, on a site 200 yards northwest of his house. This endeavor soon failed due to seepage of water into the mine. King then resorted to the evaporation of salt water in a series of large kettles. 
brine from this shaft supply the Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, Carolina, Virginia, and Scott furnaces during the war between the states.